candidate at UCSC. I'm in the visual studies department and my dissertation is gonna focus on a facet of what I'll be talking about here, but um, it's about a church that's no longer standing that was um, paid for by a couple of different um, imperial women in the fifth and sixth century. Um, the church is no longer standing. We will, I will mention the church um, in, in a future lecture, but um, yes, uh, not, not in today's, um, but it's gonna be about that on that church. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start writing soon here. Hopefully it will, hopefully it'll go well. We'll see, I'll keep you updated. Um, I'm originally from Michigan uh, and I went to Catholic school for 13 years. So um, although we'll be talking about um, Eastern Christianity, um, I, I have a lot of experience <laughs> with, with Roman Catholicism. So please feel free to ask me any questions. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to challenging questions either. So feel free to ask. I've been teaching at the college level since 2011. That's when I finished my first MA in art history uh, in Florida. So I've been traveling all around the U.S. doing school stuff, and I'm now in California. Uh, you may hear this guy in the background every once in a while. I have the, the picture in the back of, of Hagia Sophia, but he's, he's just behind me on the, the cushion behind me. Uh, so if you see anything like sort of moving around back behind me, it's, it's probably my little dog Hank. Uh, it's still his morning nap time, so he shouldn't be too loud, but just in case you hear something, that's, that's who it is. And I, I just want to start um, by saying, um, in the past when I've taught this kind of content, um, I have people get a little mad um, that maybe I'm trying to convert them to Christianity, and that's not the case at all. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to convert anyone. I, I want everyone to practice their own spirituality and their own religion and in what they're most comfortable. But we are going to talk a lot about Christianity. So just kind of a, a note on, on that. And uh, another note that there's all of history, right? But we don't know very much about it. <laughs> and this circle, this blue circle gets even smaller uh, when we think about women. Um, and this is because um, for, at least in the Mediterranean, in ancient Egypt, in um, the Middle East, in parts of Italy and other parts of Europe and Greece, men were writing down the histories. And so they were writing down what was familiar to them. And so in order to find out the, uh, the experience of a woman in this period, uh, from these periods. We have to look sort of outside in the periphery of these texts and these images and this other material. We have to read between the lines. Um, of course, the, the records that men did write do give us some insight into the lives of women, but I have a very strong feeling that women practiced rituals, they sang songs, they had uh, their own oral histories that they shared between one another, that they shared with their children, uh, that we will never really know about because they were never written down. Um, so, so keep that in mind as we, as we move along. Um, I, have a, I have a strong suspicion that women had a very rich tradition um, within all of the history that we know about that was written down and recorded but unfortunately we'll never know about that. So like I said, we must look for alternative sources to understand the marginalized groups like women and non-elite people. And a lot of this comes from the archeological record. Uh, for example, one of the other periods that I study is ancient Egypt. And we are able to get a lot of information from the archeological remains of domestic spaces, of regular houses. So. Uh, how, how women lived, what maybe private religion was like versus public religion. And, and I'm speaking especially of, of ancient Egypt, but this could apply to other regions and areas as well. And uh, you're gonna hear these two terms, uh, late antiquity and Byzantium, and they might be a little weird. So I wanted to explain those. 
The term late antiquity was coined um, in the 20th century by a historian at Princeton called Peter Brown. He's a prolific historian. He's written a lot about late antiquity and the cult of saints and, and this period just after the fall of the Roman Empire. And this is the label that I usually use um, to refer to the first century AD until roughly the sixth century AD. Um, and after that, we get this term Byzantium or Byzantine. And it's a little convoluted, but um, in the early fourth century, around 324, Constantine the Great or Constantine the First moved the capital of the, of the Roman Empire from the city of Rome in the Italian peninsula to uh, what is now Istanbul, and he named it Constantinople. But before uh, he renamed the city, it was called Byzantium. Uh, so that is the, the location, the geographic place, Byzantium. And someone or something from Byzantium is called Byzantine. And much like the city name Rome became the label for the entire empire, um, this term Byzantium became uh, applied to the entire Byzantine Empire. And the people that we call Byzantines considered themselves Romans. Um, they started speaking Greek instead of Latin, and the capital was at Constantinople rather than Rome, but uh, they would have considered themselves Roman, and they lived in Nova Roma, New Rome, uh, as opposed to the old Rome in the Italian peninsula. Uh, and so this is uh, the period that there seems to be um, a greater break between this traditional Roman past um, in about the fifth or sixth century AD. Um, and so we start to call this place and this time period and this cultural um, flourishing as Byzantine or Byzantium. And uh, Constantinople was uh, under siege in the mid 15th century and it fell to the Ottomans in 1453, actually at the end of May. So at the end of May, we can commemorate the fall of Constantinople. Um, and it was seized by the Ottomans. And then of course the Ottoman Empire flourished until uh, the 20th century. So that, that was a very long period. Uh, some of my colleagues might uh, suggest that the Byzantine Empire continued in um, St. Petersburg, which is where the Eastern um, Orthodox Church uh, set up itself um, after the fall of Constantinople. So we could say that uh, the, the, the Empire of Rome kind of in, in its traces um, survived even until the early 20th century um, in, in Russia. So uh, we're thinking of a very long period of time from roughly 500 BC until, depending on what you think, uh, 1453 AD. Um, so this, this long cultural epoch. And so Constantinople uh, was, uh, oops, was the face of, was the, the location of the, the capital of Nova Roma, New Rome, Constantinople here, where this yellow star is. Um, and this is the extent of the Roman Empire under Constantine I um, in the early fourth century uh, AD. And so you see that Constantine just moved uh, due, almost due east uh, to, to what is now Istanbul. And you see that it's at the heart of this periphery um, and so Constantine was facing many challenges from the groups of people living to the east. And so it was a strategic move, um, political and military strategic move uh, to have Constantinople in this site here. It was also at the confluence of the Mediterranean here. And there's a small Bosphorus here that connects into this body of water, the Black Sea. So it's a great trade route. It connects the east and the west really nicely. And of course, a sea route um, can be more effective than a land route. If we think of the, this concept of the Silk Road going across China 
and um, the the uh, and Central Asia. So uh, this was a strategic move on Constantine on Constantine's part. When we are looking at all of this material, I just want to remind us also to be aware of our own paradigms um, as we think about these things. Um, our our own modern situation places us quite differently from women in the ancient period. And so I just want to remind us to, to be aware of those as we continue to look at this material. <clears throat> and the study of visual material requires self-reflection. It, re it makes us stop and think, oh, why do I think this way? Did other people think a different way? So we have to be very self-reflective when we're looking at these things. And of course, um, meaning changes over time. Um, you know, I, I think especially of uh, the swastika and the meaning of the swastika. Um, now it's deeply associated with um, fascism and Nazism, but um, it's actually a Buddhist symbol that um, is rooted in um, concepts of time and, and um, regeneration and things like that. So we have to be very aware of how these, these symbols um, change over time. And of course, um, the patriarchy was deeply rooted in the Mediterranean. This is not consistent across all times and all places, but in the Mediterranean, at least, there is strong evidence of a very deeply rooted patriarchal system. And so both the patriarchy impacts how history was recorded, but so does social class. And we know the most information about elite people, especially kings and emperors. Um, but this leaves us very little information about, you know, what I consider the yous and me's of, of, of history, the people living ordinary lives. Um, so we have to be critical of the text that we have and um, keep in mind that visual material is almost as valuable, if not more valuable, than text themselves. And these are the materials that I use most frequently, our visual material. So we're gonna look a lot at the visual material and, and glean the information that we can get from that. When we are looking at images, um, I just have a few questions that we can think about when we're looking at these things. Um, on what object or material does the image appear? Uh, where was this image? Um, I think a lot about this in terms of in a church and where you're looking in a church, why it's placed there and things like that. Uh, so this falls into the next bullet point. What in what environment does the image appear? Are there inscriptions? Inscriptions are great. I love when there are inscriptions by an image. It, it can help us understand things so much better. Um, are there animals or humans? Is it totally abstract or schematic? Is it just plants um, and animals, things like that? And when we're talking about Christian imagery um, and other religious imagery, I think that if there are other figures there, what they're looking at or who they're looking at can help us understand uh, very important meanings in the image. And we're going to explore some of, the, some of that um, in, in, in shortly. Uh, are any of the figures looking out at us? Uh, that can be important, especially when we're talking about icons later in the Byzantine period, the eighth and ninth, ninth century, etc. Um, are the are the figures holding anything? A lot of times in Christian images, if they're holding something, this can help us understand who that figure is. A lot of times, saints or other religious figures have attributes that um, help. The, the viewer understand who or what they are. Um, and it's really interesting because um, in the Byzantine period, these sort of contrived artistic conventions actually manifest uh, to help people identify these figures in their own life. So um, if you had a dream of say, St. Stephen uh, in the dream, the saint would usually appear just as he appeared in a work of art. So these become the, the images that people associate with that figure, even though it's not likely that perhaps that's the way the, the historical person really looked. So these images become really important. 
Um, how is motion represented? Is there movement at all? With icons in the Byzantine period, the, the images are usually very static and frozen in time and space. Um, so movement is, is significant. Um, and then how is the status or the social class of the individual represented? So these are just some questions you can keep in mind as we, as we move along. Now I chose the title. Someone was, was talking about this uh, as we were gathering this morning because um, women in late antiquity and Byzantium were stuck between these two paradigms of, the, of Venus or Aphrodite and the Virgin. And um, Venus or Aphrodite was associated closely with uh, erotic love um, and sex and fertility. And the Virgin was almost the, the antithesis of, of Venus or Aphrodite. She was chaste, she re, uh, theologically, she remained a virgin for her entire life. Uh, so this is in direct opposition to Venus or Aphrodite who had many lovers who bore several children. Um, and Venus or, or Aphrodite had uh, conjugal relationships with um, men that, um, that produced children, they were begetted from either divine men or, or mortal men, whereas the Virgin conceived from the Holy Spirit. So this, and, you know, so this is, this is quite different. Um, we also see the images of Venus or Aphrodite. She's often depicted naked. We're going to talk ab about nakedness, um, in the classical period. Um, and then the Virgin is usually illustrated fully clothed. There are a few images where her breasts are exposed, um, but in this, she's nursing the Christ child. It's not for, you know, the delectation of the viewer or anything like that. So women were stuck between these two. And usually on this spectrum of between Venus and Virgin, ordinary women fell closer to Venus or Aphrodite because the Virgin uh, was this paradigm that no mortal woman could achieve. Um, and so this was, this kind of creates this really difficult um, exemplum for women to, to try to, to work with. Um, and so we're gonna talk a lot about how women fit into this spectrum um, and how the spectrum was established from very early on, even before uh, Christianity was developed. Uh, so the region we're going to be talking about uh, is roughly um, this region here. By the 6th century, you can see that Byzantium was within the, this red line here. That was all of Byzantium. And if you recall from the other uh, images, Rome under Constantine um, the first had its borders up as far north as parts of England, um, then most of uh, Western Europe, much further south in, in North Africa. Um, and then after the reign of Justinian, the, the borders of Byzantium continually shrank, usually shrinking. Sometimes they would expand a little bit, but um, for in the 12th century, Byzantium was just the city of Constantinople, uh, and then in the 15th century as well. So uh, they, they're constantly shrinking and grow and, and expanding. Um, and you see here the uh, the star where Constantinople or Byzantium is, and you can see that there's this small waterway here between Asia Minor and uh, parts of um, Eastern, excuse me, Western Europe. And then there's another uh, small uh, seaway here um, into the Black Sea. And then um, this is the Crimea here, uh, which is relevant to the news today, just to give you a, a sense of, of everything. So here's Constantinople. And during um, the earliest parts of, the, the, of late antiquity, um, there was also an exarchate um, in Ravenna. So there was an emperor ruling from Ravenna in addition to Constantinople. So during parts of late antiquity, we actually had two emperors ruling. 
So here is Constantinople as it uh, stood um, up until, you know, the, the fifth uh, and sixth century. Um, and then, of course, this is the wall of Theodosius here, which is an extremely thick, heavily fortified wall that took the Ottomans a really long time to get through. And actually, it was by taking boats across land and sailing them into what we call the Golden Horn here that the Ottomans were able to get into Constantinople itself. And the most significant area is down here at the at the coast on the Bosphorus between the Sea of Marmara here and then this is the inlet here the Bosphorus um, and this is where the imperial complex was and this was made up of the palace uh, the Chalka Gate, Hagia Sophia, Hagia Irini um, and then the Hippodrome is here this was connected to the imperial palace uh, and so there, there, this was the, the imperial complex down here. And now if you go to Istanbul, this right here is where the Ottoman palace was constructed. So they, they kept the imperial aspects of uh, this sort of section of Constantinople, even into the Ottoman, even into the Ottoman Empire. The Church of Saint, uh, uh, excuse me, of the Holy Apostles is here. And this uh, is no longer standing. Um, uh, as, as a Christian monument, and it is where most of the Byzantine and late antique emperors were interred. This is where they were buried. So this is another important site. And you can see that there are a number of fortified walls. So in the Roman period, um, Septimius Severus constructed a wall here, and then um, another wall here. Constantine constructed another wall, and then Theodosius II in the fifth century constructed this wall here that goes all the way up to the Golden Horn and down to the Sea of Marmara. And this protected the city extensively. Really important walls. Any questions so far? We're okay? Okay, great. So let's just talk about the Greek and Roman past before we get into Christianity, because of course, a lot of the sort of cultural, aspects of Christianity were rooted in the Greek and the Roman past. So let's start with the Greek past. And we're going to be talking about uh, this area right here. And in ancient Greece, they were uh, a colonizing um, people. And so they actually had Greek colonies all along the Mediterranean coast. There were colonies in Sicily, in the Italian peninsula, um, especially along the coast here. Um, in, in what is now Palestine and, and what we call Asia Minor. So lots of colonies all along this area. They weren't really an empire. They were this more of a loose confederation of these city-states and colonies. But this allowed Greek culture to spread extensively throughout, throughout this, this area. Uh, and then the other part we're going to talk about is, of course, the Italian peninsula here. This is where uh, the city of Rome is located and where the spread of the Roman culture sort of uh, originated out of the city of Rome. Um, and the ancient Greeks were a patriarchal people. Uh, they had a warrior culture. Their culture was deeply competitive and we see this in the very uh, early origins of Hellenic, Hellenic and Greek culture. They were extremely competitive. And this competition manifested in religion, uh, politics, and of course the military where uh, the Greeks were constantly at war almost either with each other or with the Persians or with other groups of people. And so because of this military lifestyle, uh, it meant that there was a division of power and labor, and men would go off and fight in the wars while the women would stay home and manage the house and the family. And while this might seem like a noble duty for women, um, it actually put them in a really difficult situation. Because of the military um, lifestyle, many women lost their husbands. So they were single mothers. They, they married really early, as early as the age of 12. Um, and so sometimes they would be widowed 
at the age of 12, 13, 14, and they may have at least one child to take care of. And perhaps if depending on their social status, a huge estate to manage as well. Um, so they really had to rely on their training that they may have gotten growing up from their mothers or other sort of teachers. Um, and so women's lives were, were not, not easy, um, even though they didn't face military battle like men did. And um, some of the recordings, uh, the written histories that we have are, are not super flattering for women. So Semenides of Amargos wrote this poem called The Types of Women. And I just have a few excerpts here. Um, but the whole poem, you can find it online, um, is from roughly the seventh century BC. And Semenides goes on and on um, likening women to various animals. So I just have a few stanzas here. It's about a hundred uh, hundred lines, maybe a little more than a hundred lines. So this is just a few of the lines. So on the left, we have one of the stanzas from the start, the gods made women different. One type is from a pig, a hairy sow, whose house is like a rolling heap of filth. And she herself, unbathed in one unwashed clothes, reposes on the shit pile growing fat. So from the very first, this is the first stanza in the poem. We know what some of these thinks of some women. Uh, a little bit later, he goes on to say, one type the gods of Mount Olympus crafted out of the earth, their gift to man, she's lame and has no sense of either good or bad. She knows no useful skill except to eat. And when the gods make winter cold and hard, she drag her chair up closer to the fire. So she's lazy. Um, she's made of the earth, right? Um, so she's not like a pig. She's like dirt, I guess. Um, and she, she doesn't have any useful skills. Women were expected to constantly weave and create um, textiles. So they were either spinning thread and we'll look at some more images of, of this aspect of women's life um, in future lectures, but um, weaving, cooking, managing the household, raising children, these were the things that women were expected, the skills that women were expected to have. Um, and so if all she's doing is eating, she's not a useful person, she's, she's not doing what she's supposed to do, she's not living up to the standards of, of Greek proper behavior. Um, and then she's just, warming herself by the fire. So this is, this is another bad woman. Um, and so he keeps going on and he says, another loathsome, miserable type is from a weasel. Undesirable in every way, uncharming, unalluring. She's sex crazed too. But any man who climbs aboard her will get seasick. And she steals from neighbors and from sacrificial feasts. And this last, uh, couple of words is really important. She's so stealing from sacrificial feasts. This is extremely bad behavior. Stealing from the gods could be detrimental, uh, perhaps lethal uh, in, in Greek thought. Um, so in ancient Greece, they would have these wonderful feasts. Um, and the bigger the feast, the more important the animal that was sacrificed. So the biggest feast and there's a really nice record of this in um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They, they sacrifice these great animals for the gods before they go off to war. Um, and it's usually like a big bull or an ox. And essentially it's like a big barbecue because they let the gods smell the wonderful odor of the meat cooking. Um, and then they give them the best parts of the animal to, cons to consume ritually. Um, and then everybody else gets to have like a, basically a big ox roast. So it's like this great festival with lots of eating. But stealing from these storage rooms uh, of the gifts of food and drink to the gods is extremely bad behavior. And of course there are myths where this happens and the person who has stolen is struck down in some, in some horrible way. The last, one of the last stanzas of the poem, Semenides talks about the, the ideal woman. And the ideal woman is like a bee, but good luck in finding such a woman. Only she deserves to be exempt from stinging blame. The household that she manages will thrive. 
a loving wife beside her loving man. She'll grow old, having born illustrious and handsome children. She herself shines bright among all women. Grace envelops her. She doesn't like to sit with the other women discussing sex. Zeus gratifies mankind with these most excellent and thoughtful wives. But in this long list of bad women, the bee is the only type of woman that is, that is good. Um, and so she gives birth to boys, in theory, who become great athletes or become great warriors. And this, is a, this was a way through their male offspring, this was a way for a woman to really have an illustrious life. So even her, she, you know, her own um, characteristics or her own accomplishments are attached to men. So this is how women be, um, you know, define themselves with their relationships to men, um, or at least that's how men want them to define themselves. Um, and she manages the household well. She is loving to her husband. We know that um, most of the time uh, marriages were arranged in ancient Greece, usually for economic purposes. And so this means that um, not all of the, you know, the concept of a love match is relatively new. Uh, and so there may not have been... Uh, couples that got along well at all, it might have been rare to have a, a spouse that you could get along with. So this is quite unique um, among the experiences of everyday people. One of the last lines of the poem, Semenidi says, but by the grim contrivances of Zeus, all these other types are here to stay, these other types of women, side by side with man forever. Yes, Zeus made this the greatest pain of all, woman. And this is men who are going off to battle constantly, numerous times a year. And apparently the biggest pain of all is women. So uh, it's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, comparative thing to think about. In The Economist by Xanophon, this is from about 200 years later, we continue to have this naturalization of the differences between men and women. And he, um, through this, he has some characters that are, are, are in dialogue in this, this written story that he has. And Iskomachus, one of the, the characters, is talking about his wife and his, his experience. And he's talking about the, um, the, uh, the differences between men and women and why men are suited for one type of lifestyle and women are suited to another type of lifestyle. And even in the Semenides, we see that it's Zeus that creates these differences with men and women. And so by naturalizing these qualities and making them inherent to both men and women, this helps to create this division between labor and between the genders. And it also allows men to be elevated above women. Um, and so in The Economist, he says, God made provision from this first by shaping, as it seems to me, the woman's nature for indoor and the man's for outdoor occupations. So he's saying, this is God or the gods that did this. this is, I'm not saying this, this is not society, it's God. So it's rooting this in this religious primordial um, aspect. Man's body and soul he furnished with a greater capacity for enduring heat and cold, wayfaring and military marches, or to repeat, he laid upon his shoulders the outdoor works. While in creating the body of woman with less capacity for these things, I continued, so Iskomoskis is talking, God would seem to have imposed on her the indoor works, and knowing that, he implanted in the woman and imposed upon her the nurture of newborn babies. He endowed her with a larger share of affection for the newborn child than he bestowed upon the man. So women just inherently love children more, so that's why women stay at home with the children. Uh, and since he imposed on woman the guardianship of the things imported from without, God, in his wisdom, perceiving that a fearful spirit was no detriment to guardianship, endowed the woman with a larger measure of timidity than he bestowed on man. So they're, they're meeker, they're more timid, so they need men to protect them. They're not going to be 
courageous enough to go out into battle, knowing further that he to whom the outdoor works belonged would need to defend them against malign attack, he endowed the man in turn with a larger share of courage. So we know that uh, some women have trouble bearing children. Uh, they might have trouble even developing an affectionate relationship with their children. And I know many very peaceful men who may not have wanted to go out to battle maybe. Um, and so by naturalizing these aspects of gender and making them inherent, there's actually a detriment to both genders because they have to fill, fill these roles according to society that maybe are not natural to them. Um, maybe they prefer peace. They prefer not going out to war. Uh, they prefer to not be at home with children um, and raising children. Maybe they didn't want to have children. We're going to talk about this a lot more, but women died frequently in childbirth. And so it's very likely to me that a, a young girl getting married at 12, knowing that her mother died very young, would be quite terrified of having children and maybe didn't want to. Um, there's also an aspect of if a woman is pregnant, say at a very young age, 12, 13, 14, her husband goes off to war, what is her financial status going to be like if she's um, pregnant while the man is at war and he dies and she gives birth to a child who she cannot support? So, if we think about the realities of these people, there's, there's so much conflict and so many things to think about that these, these written stories by Simonides and Xenophon do not address um, because we know that life doesn't go <laughs> as planned, right? And life doesn't ever go as, as society might think is best. Um, so it's important for us to think about all this, the sides of, of what these things mean. In visual culture, we often see this dichotomy in ancient Greek works of art. And both of these sculptures are from the 500s BC. And we see that the male um, is a core, it's called a Koros sculpture. And he is illustrated fully naked. Uh, he is striding forth with his left foot uh, striding forward. We see that the artist doesn't have um, total accuracy with the, the depiction of the figure. There's still some sort of schematic aspects of the figure. Um, we do get a small sense of maybe um, abs, as it were, but even his braids or his curls are abstract and schematic looking at the on the uh, behind his head here, and sort of a, this triangular chest, this sort of rectangle for his, his pelvis, and then these cylinders for his legs. Um, on the other hand, the female figure is fully clothed. She's standing very still. She's almost like a column rather than striding forward in space. And we get the sense that this is kind of how women were perceived, right? If we think about this in comparison to Xanophon or even Simonides, uh, a woman was kind of this column on which the household stood. Um, she raised the children, she managed the estate, and the man was off being active in, in the world. And so these polar opposites that were naturalized and made inherent to both genders created this dichotomy. Men were human, women were animals. And we see this very clearly in the Samnides poem. Um, men were Greek, women were more like barbarians. And we see this in stories of like the Amazons, right? So the Amazons were this group of wild, uh, untamed women who were uh, militaristic. Um, and they went into battle with the Greeks. And of course, the Greeks defeated them because they are civilized and, and uh, you know, better than all other people in the world. Uh, so they conquered the Amazons, but they were women. They were wild. They were barbarians. They were not Greek. Um, and then we have male versus female. Um, men are active, women are passive. 
men are strong, women are weak. Men are moral, women are immoral. We see this in the Simonides poem as well. Men are in control, women have access. They cry, they weep, they moan, they wail. Um, and so this is evidence that they are not in control of their emotions, whereas a man is in full control of his emotions. And we see this exemplified in numerous works of art. Uh, men are in possession of reason. Women, again, are emotional. Men are hot. And we see this in the Xanophon as well. Women are cold. And this is also um, manifested, this concept is also manifested in the work of Hippocrates um, and his ideas of um, the four humors. Um, we, we are gonna talk about that in a future lecture as well. Um, and the, few, the, the humors are also associated with dryness and wetness. Women, men are dry and women are wet. So, this, so we have this strong dichotomy between the two and this polarization, um, polar opposites that women and men are. And so this polarization further manifests itself um, in other works of art. I really like both of these funeral stella. So these are funeral monuments. They're now housed in um, a museum, but they were outside for many, many years. Um, and they were monuments to the deceased. And we'll just take a little bit closer look at, at this. But women were enclosed in the home and men were warriors who participated actively in public life. So if we take a look at this grave stele of Hagasso, we see Hagasso here. She's seated on this beautiful chair. She obviously came from a wealthy family. She has this beautiful um, garment on and she is probably holding, well, her servant here, another female, is holding a little box that probably contained her jewelry. And she would have probably been holding a necklace. And you can see by her hand gesture, she has one piece up at the top and then the other half of the necklace would have been draped down into her fingers here. So she would have been holding a, a type of a necklace. So she's looking at her jewelry. And this aligns quite well with the concepts that women fulfilled. Um, Is it time? I may have missed the window. Oh, um, maybe we'll win. So women fulfilled this. Um, they, they were often performing their femininity because part of their role was to have children, especially sons. And in order to have children, they would need to be alluring for their husband. Um, never, they, they weren't supposed to take any kinds of lovers or anything like that, so their husband. And in alluring their husband, they would make sure that they had beautiful complexion, beautiful hair, beautiful clothing, and then they had also adorned themselves in jewels, earrings, bracelets, necklaces, bangles of all kinds, um, beautiful textiles, and so this speaks to this aspect of Hegesso being alluring for her husband, or if she was unmarried, preparing to be alluring for her husband, um, despite the fact that she was unmarried, but learning this, this type of behavior. Like I said, we do love it when there are inscriptions, and thankfully there are some inscriptions here. So at the top, we have the identity of the deceased, Hegesso, daughter of Proxenos. And so again, Hegesso is, you know, not known for her beauty. She's known because she's the daughter of Proxenos. Um, and so again, we get the sense that she is from the elite status in Athens. Both of the, the stele that we're gonna be looking at are from Athens, so from the Athenian elite. She's sitting on this beautiful chair. Her feet are actually elevated above the sort of ground line here. And so we also get the sense of her status because she's just ever so slightly elevated above her, probably her slave here, uh, another female. Uh, and we both, uh, that we see that they are both looking down at the jewel. So um, Hagesso is engaged with this womanly pursuit of adorning herself, her slave is assisting her and perhaps learning the behavior of a proper Athenian woman of adorning herself and being alluring 
for a proper husband. Notice also that she is fully enclosed in this um, architectural frame. We have these columns here, and we do have the sort of um, uh, pediment here, this triangular shape here, that gives her a, a more of a frame. But the columns there indicate that she is a proper Greek woman. She's enclosed within the home. There are numerous literary texts that indicate that women stayed within the confines of their homes, um, especially elite women. I imagine ordinary women would go out and work in the fields with their husbands, um, go out to co collect water. The slave figure here probably went out to collect water as well. But the, the proper Athenian woman, Hegeso, is enclosed within the home, adorning herself, engaging in proper uh, womanly activities. If we take a look at the grave stele of Dexalios, we see an opposite. We do see the pediment at the top here. Um, and this may suggest, oops, sorry. <laughs> this may suggest an enclosure, but this just really creates a frame for the, the text. Vexilios is the figure riding the horse, and we see that he is not enclosed with this, these framing columns. He is free to be outside in the world, um, and he is not enclosed within the home. So these very small visual cues tell us a lot about the state of women and their and their and men and their lifestyles and the um, the social constraints that they worked within at the time. Vexilios was a uh, warrior and from the inscription at the bottom of the stele here we see uh, I have the, the transcription uh, just to the right Vexilios, son of Lysanias of Therikos. He was born in the archonship of Tesandros, which is roughly the year 414 to 413 um, BC. And he died in that of Evlides, so 394-3, at Corinth, one of the five cavalrymen. And we see here that Vexilios is in the act of slaying um, an enemy. So he is memorialized here for his bravery, for his engagement in this warrior culture of ancient Greece. We think a lot of the Athenian um, prowess in the military, but of course there were Corinthians and Thebans and um, Mycenaeans working um, in the military as well. Uh, Spartans, of course. Um, and so here we don't just have this note that Vexilios is the son of Lysanias, Instead, he is memorialized for his victory. We actually know when he was born. We actually know when he died. We don't have that information for Agesso. So just these tiny little inscriptions can tell us a lot about the status of men and women. You may have heard this concept of heroic nudity that's associated with ancient Greek art, but here we have a little bit of a flip on that concept. So here, um, Dexilios is, is fully dressed in this um, hitomiskos. He has this short sort of chiton that he's wearing. He also has this kind of cape uh, flowing behind him. And you see that he's not scared. You'll recall that men were supposed to be in full control of their, their emotions. And here we see that Dexilios was. He's memor memorialized in this way. He's almost bored looking while, while defeating this enemy, right? Um, he has this very stoic expression on his face. The warrior here also has a stoic expression, but this indicates that this was a, a formidable foe. You know, he wasn't just slaying people that weren't also brave, right? So by illustrating that Vexilios is slaying an equally bold and brave foe, it's elevating Vexilios as well. He's also a cavalryman. Um, I don't know if anyone owns a horse or has owned horses in the past, but they're super expensive, right? Even today, they're just so expensive. They eat a ton. They need special housing uh, and care. Um, you know, they need to get their, their hooves trimmed, you know, fairly often. 
And so even in Corinth in the uh, 400s and 300s, uh, horse ownership was a status symbol. Um, and to say that Vexillos was a cavalryman meant that he had a lot of wealth. He was uh, high up in the military. And so they're really honoring him in this uh, way uh, by illustrating him with his horse. They're not just saying he had a horse, but illustrating him with the horse and slaying this formidable enemy. I'm sorry, I got off track with the heroic nudity. Um, so that's Leos is fully dressed, but the, the enemy that he's slaying is naked. And while the Koro statue from the 500s is naked, um, this illustrates the aspect that the, uh, the aspect of that the Greeks conceptualized that the male body was perfect and didn't have to be covered up, unlike the female body. Other cultures had this idea that nakedness was associated with shame. We see this in Hebrew uh, practice, we see this in ancient Egyptian practice, and we see this in some other um, ancient Eastern cultures as well. Um, but here, we do have this use of nakedness as shame for the enemy being slayed. Um, and we see that Vexlaios is looking down in this wonderful diagonal, uh, down at the enemy. And I like this curve here. It must be the enemy's shield that helps to direct our eye back up and then down. So we have this really wonderful sort of um, circle that's created with the diagonals um, in the image here that keep directing our eye up and down into this, um, this moment of defeat for the deceased. Any questions so far? Are you okay? Okay, great. So um, as I mentioned, men could uh, appear naked and they often did even in public. Uh, women uh, usually did not appear naked. Um, if they were naked in public, this usually happened at um, all male feasting events um, where a woman would come to entertain the guests of the symposium. And this woman was usually an actress, which usually meant that she uh, could be uh, coerced or forced into a sexual relationship with any of the guests at the symposium. So um, this meant that they would perform naked or with very little clothing on. These were not proper Greek women. Um, they were slaves or women who were not of an elite status. Uh, and so a proper Greek woman would always appear heavily draped like the small figure on the right here um, because sexualization uh, of the naked body for a woman uh, was also extreme, demonstrated her vulnerability. Whereas a naked man was strong, he was heroized, he was idealized. Um, and I really like the direction of both of the figures' gazes here, right? So if we look at the figure on the left, he's called the Deriferos or the spear bearer. And we see that he's looking off into the distance. He's kind of carefree. He's called the spear bearer because he would have been holding probably a bronze spear over his shoulder here. Um, this is a Roman copy. The original was probably made of bronze and then at some point uh, melted down. We see that much like that Poro sculpture, the figure is striding forward, um, but here he's in the contrapposto pose, so it's a much more naturalized pose. Um, I always tell my um, college students that the next time they go to the grocery store, I guarantee when they're standing in line, they'll, they'll find themselves in a contrapposto pose. So I challenge you to see if, if that happens to you as well. Um, whereas the female, is fully draped, she's fully covered because she probably would have been aware that showing any skin uh, below her neck uh, would invite trouble. Um, and she's also looking down. Whereas the Deriferos is looking off, he's looking up into the world around him, the female's looking down. She knows that her world is enclosed and she's further creating this enclosure by not making eye contact with anyone or looking out into the distance like the Deriferos does. 
Shockingly, uh, women start to appear naked in works of art about 350 BC. And one of the first instances that we know about of a woman, uh, a proper Greek woman appearing naked in a work of art is uh, this image on the right. It is a copy of a Greek original by Praxiteles. Um, this is called the Canadian Aphrodite or the Aphrodite of Knidos. And Knidos is a small island in the, C in the Cyclades, um, just so in the middle of the Mediterranean there. And the story behind the statue is that um, Praxiteles originally made this for another city-state. And um, the city-state was like, uh, that's Aphrodite and she's naked, that's unacceptable. And the Canadians were like, oh, well, we'll take it. We'll take that sculpture. And so this essentially became a tourist attraction. Um, she was placed, uh, the, the sculpture was placed in a Tholos um, temple, which is a round temple with columns all around the exterior. So you could actually see the sculpture as you're walking up towards the, the temple. So she was always exposed. This naked figure was always exposed. Um, and there are numerous stories of people visiting uh, Knidos to see this sculpture and the shock that um, accompanied the, the, the unclothed appearance of this sculpture is, is really amazing in the historical record. Uh, so after this, we, after three, about 350 BC, we do start to see images of Aphrodite um, illustrated naked, but normal women uh, remain in works of art. They remain clothed um, and um, fully covered. And this um, has to do with the way that Aphrodite is associated with erotic love and begetting of children. And of course, you know, sex acts are often uh, uh, committed in, in, in nake, uh, while naked. And so this, this has to do with that concept. But we see that her clothing is not far away from her, right? So here, Aphrodite is either getting ready to clothe herself or she's just taken her clothing off. Um, so we think that the, the sort of narrative behind the, the sculpture is that she was getting into or out of the bath. So it's this very vulnerable mo moment for a woman, um, even a divinity. Uh, and so her clothes are not far. So she's still sort of got these very vague traces of modesty. We also see her hand as making an attempt to cover her pelvis. Uh, again, this, uh, this attempt at modesty. A uh, question? Please. And uh, in, in the male figure there, they, he has what I think it's called the pelvic girdle. And yes. I, re I heard this explained before, but I don't understand it because everything else is so anatomically realistic and that's not. Why did the Greeks do that? Yeah. Um, so are you talking about his penis? No, no. Oh. Uh, above, you know, he's got oh, his hips? folds, the folds of... Uh, yes. So that is a great question. Um, and it's, it's something that is, is so interesting to me because ancient Greek artists wanted to create figures that looked like the gods. And this would elevate their craft. So it would make them really great artists if they could create an image that looked like the gods. Um, and it also made, you know, it imbued their sculpture with, um, you know, this divine aura, right? And so the ancient Greeks conceptualized the divinities as very human-like, but, but to the extreme, like the best human. So in creating these sculptures, they would push visually the appearance of the human body to make it the best, right? And so I often think of it as them kind of like, today we have this concept of like airbrushing a photograph to, to improve its appearance. And so this isn't airbrushing, but they're pushing the appearance of the body to make it appear what they think the gods looked like, which was like the best body they could imagine. And so here I can see the artist going, oh, well, if a normal human body that's really toned looks like this, 
a, a divine body must push that appearance even further and look even more more detailed and sort of intense does that make sense mm. so yeah. sort of putting muscles where they don't really exist e exactly exactly so they're like oh well the greeks the gods must have these kinds of muscles you know so yeah great question though thank you so again if we go back to the title of the the course i've, I've chosen this this aspect, uh, you know, these this uh, this spectrum between Venus or Aphrodite and the Virgin. So let's just talk about Venus and Aphrodite. According to the Theogony by Hesiod, um, Aphrodite was created from the severed testicles of Uranus or Ur Uran uh, Uranus, um, who was uh, this personification of the heavens, and the te his testicles fell into the sea. And I'm not sure what happened in the sea, but they uh, rose up as foam, and from out of this foam sprang Aphrodite. Um, and so, if you think of that Botticelli painting of the of, um, the birth of Venus, and she's kind of floating into shore on the seashell, that's part of this story. Um, she's being born from the sea. Now there are numerous. Uh, myths. So Homer actually says that Aphrodite is the daughter of Zeus and another female called Dione. So there are these two um, conflicting narratives. Um, I think that um, the Urano story is most often depicted in um, sort of like Renaissance works of art, but we actually see in the Parthenon sculpture, Aphrodite is seated next to Dione. So we do have um, evidence for both for both stories in the visual material um, from the ancient period. In ancient Greece, Aphrodite is associated with human fertility, marriage, and erotic love. She has uh, several lovers, um, and these are Hephaestus, her husband, according to Homer, but she also had uh, relationships with Ares, and it is with Ares that she begets Eros, who is um, conflated with Cupid in the Roman tradition. There is evidence that um, Aphrodite is connected to Ishtar and Astarte, and these are divinities from the Eastern period, uh, sorry, from the Eastern traditions. So the, the Sumerians or the Mesopotamians, um, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, et cetera. These are two um, female um, divinities. It's interesting though because Ishtar is a, a Mesopotamian deity and she's both the goddess of love and war. So these very strong different sort of passionate um, aspects of daily life. Um, but Ishtar often appears naked as well. Um, one of her cult centers in ancient Greece was in Corinth. And so um, there was a special devotion to Aphrodite in Corinth. In the Roman tradition, um, she is called Venus. And because there were so many col Greek colonies on the Italian peninsula, the Greek religion deeply influenced the Latin religion of the Romans. Um, but there is also some influence from the Etruscans as well. And so although there are many similarities between Aphrodite and Venus, um, it's, it's important for us to be careful when we're thinking about the Roman tradition or the Greek tradition. So, there, so women are really stuck with this concept of, of Venus um, and, and her unfaithfulness, her uh, like... Um, restless libido, her unquenchable libido, um, her promiscuity, her nakedness. Um, and so these are concepts that are, are deeply connected to all women and made inherent in women as well. Uh, so when we're talking about Rome, we're talking about the, the Italian peninsula, but also the expanse of Rome as it pushed its borders out. And as I mentioned, uh, there were numerous colonies, Greek colonies, along the Italian peninsula.
but they were also, um, the Greeks were also in contact with this group called the Etruscans, and they lived in what is now called uh, Tuscany, which is rooted in the word Etruscan or Etruria. Um, and so the Etrurian religion, Etruscan religion also impacted the Roman religion. Um, and I want to um, emphasize that even the founding um, myths and stories around uh, the founding of Rome are connected with sexual violence and, and women. Um, so prior to the establishment of the Roman Republic, the Italian Peninsula or that region along the sort of southwestern coast of the Italian Peninsula were controlled by a, an Etruscan monarchy. And the Etruscan monarch Sextus, Sextus Tarquinius uh, raped a, an Italian, a Roman noblewoman called Lucrezia. And because Lucrezia was so um, embarrassed by this rape, uh, she committed suicide, and her suicide led to a rebellion and the establishment of the Roman Republic. So the violation of women um, and violence and death are closely associated with Roman origin stories, which is sort of weird for us to think about um, how women were symbols for um, being conquered um, in this way. So Tarquinius, uh, Sextus Tarquinius conquered and raped uh, Lucrezia. She was so ashamed that she committed suicide and this um, in turn caused people to rebel and to overthrow the monarchy. So it's important for us to think about the position of women given this origin story. In the 12 tables, which were established during the Roman Republic, uh, which was a period of, of you know, a strong political establishment uh, controlled by a Senate. Uh, and that was in, in control for about 500 years before Julius Caesar took control. But these 12 tables were the root of the Roman law. And even within these laws, we see where women fit into society. Um, and one of the most important laws says, our ancestors saw fit that females by reason of levity of disposition shall remain in guardianship even when they have attained their majority. So even when they've reached uh, an, the age of adulthood, they still need to have a guardian. The only women who did not have a guardian, guardian were Vestal virgins, and I'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, but we see Again, this difference in the um, appearance of women um, and the patriarchy in Rome. So on the left, we have Livia, Augusta Livia as ops. So she's associated with fertility of the earth and protection of the people. And then on the right, we have Augustus. Um, and this sculpture was found at Prima Porta. But here he is illustrated as a military person. Um, so again, we have these dichotomies of, of where women are supposed to be and where men are supposed to be. Women were meant to bear legitimate children. Men were supposed to um, participate in active public life. Um, all men were expected, in, in Greece as well, were expected to participate in political life. Um, and so we see that as an important aspect. The Vestal Virgins were the only women who did not have to have guardianship after their majority, but they had a kind of a crazy life. Um, these were women who were devoted to the goddess Vesta, who is sort of equated with the Greek goddess Hestia, the goddess of the hearth and home. And the women in this college, as it was called, were devoted to protecting the flame of the city. And if the flame went out, the, the women got in really big trouble because the, the flame was a symbol for Rome. And so if the flame went out, that meant the empire or, or the Republic was going to fall. So caring for this flame was really important. Um, both the flame and the vestals were symbols of the empire. If you raped a vestal virgin, uh, it was very, very bad because this, the, this, the Vestal Virgins were a symbol of Rome. So by conquering, by rape of a Vestal Virgin, you 
this was the concept of raping the city and the, the city falling in some way. So these were women selected from the very elite levels of society. They were entered into the college at the age of six and they were requ required to spend 30 years in the college. Once, if they survived um, to the age of 36, which was very likely the Vestal Virgins had great food, great health care. They weren't, uh, they took vows of chastity, so they weren't bearing children. So this was a life-threatening sort of part of life. Um, and so it was very likely that they would survive to the age of 36. After the age of 36, they were free to do whatever they want. Um, they could control their own wealth. They could control their own lives. Um, they could get married. But of course, at the age of 36, a woman would have been considered well past the age of childbearing and, and marriage. So um, we don't, I, I'm not aware of any stories of any Vestal Virgins after their, um, their service to the, to the college, but it's very interesting. Um, but they can con control their own lives. So this was really wonderful. Uh, what's interesting about Vestal Virgins is if they did have sex outside, uh, you know, and broke their vow of chastity to Vesta, there was this law that made physical, physically harming a Vestal Virgin illegal. So to bypass this, um, if a Vestal Virgin broke her vow of chastity, she was buried alive. <laughs> so this was a way to get around physically harming her, but still executing her as was, as was necessary. So uh, from the age of six, if this is hanging over your head, I imagine that might be quite terrifying as well. Uh, so quite interesting. Um, okay, so by the first century um, AD, this is when Augustus Caesar is in control of the Roman Empire. Um, this is the grand nephew of Julius Caesar, who was made Julius Caesar's heir. So in Rome, we have the, imper uh, the empire fully established. And in Greece, uh, things had sort of fallen apart after the reign of, if you will, of Alexander the so-called Great. And so it's not doing quite as well as it had been. Um, and so in Judea, uh, which is roughly this area here, we have this Hebrew man who is going around and causing a lot of fuss. Um, he's not the first, the last, or the only rebel in uh, this region, but the Hebrews are giving the Romans a really hard time. They won't submit to uh, the religious uh, sacrifices that the Romans want them to make. Uh, to the emperor because they are a monotheistic religion. So there's a lot of unrest in this region, um, especially among the Hebrews, among others as well. I can't imagine being a, a Roman citizen was super easy. So I'm just taking a look at the time. And uh, so we're going to focus on this region here. The Hebrew precedent uh, also informed Christianity and the way women were treated. The book of Genesis um, in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew tradition, the Jewish tradition, it's called the Tanakh. We have the first two people are Adam and Eve. And this is uh, people that are created by God or Yahweh. And they're punished but for disobeying God. Um, and God is the only divinity worshipped by the Hebrews. And ultimately, these two are expelled from the paradise, the Garden of Eden. So because of Eve's uh, having disobeyed God, she also taints all of women from inherently. Um, so all women are sort of uh, the legacy of Eve. And so they're considered sinful. They're, you know, they mislead men. They, they make men do bad things and things like that. Um, so just like in the Greek and the Roman tradition, women were expected to remain at home, care for children, and manage the household. They were also expected to dress modestly and to avoid luxurious ornaments. So this is in contrast to the Greek and Roman tradition. Women are meant to be sort of austere, not bring attention to themselves, as it were. Uh, so if we, if we look deeply at the book of Genesis, 
we have this story about the seven days of creation. So man, humans, are one of the last things that God creates. And so here we have um, some mosaics from Sicily uh, and Palermo. These are from the 12th century. But here we have God the Logos in the form of like Jesus, right? So Jesus had not yet come to earth, but he is this sort of human manifestation. So we see him appear here. And I love this kind of laser coming out of Jesus's, the Logos's mouth, and it's directed at the nostrils of Adam here, because that was where breathing was thought to occur. So it's coming from the mouth of the Logos and into the nostrils of Adam, and he's breathing life into Adam here. And again, we have the uh, inscription. So here you see the word Adam. So you know that this is Adam, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eve is created second, and here we have Eve being created out of the rib of Adam. So Adam is asleep here, and Eve is sort of coming out of his chest, formed from the rib. And here again we have the inscription Eva, so we know that this is Eve. Uh, and again we have the Logos appearing here. And from Genesis chapter two, we see, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We sh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. So this also naturalizes the secondary nature of women to men. Um, so by naturalizing this, this, this creates this great precedent um, for, for treating women in this way that we see through, throughout the Mediterranean. Um, but we also have this contrasting verse from the Bible that says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there are these words that are a little confusing um, from the Bible, um, but still naturalizing this, this story of, of men first and women second. Here we have them eating the forbidden fruit. Um, and so this is when the fall of man happens. Eve is tempted and persuaded by the snake or the devil to eat this forbidden fruit from this tree at the center of the Garden of Eden. And then Eve says, oh, I got this fruit, Adam, why don't you eat it? So she tricks him into eating the fruit as well. So the book of Genesis says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And this is a interesting image because here, um, before she eats the fruit, she does not have this head covering. So she's not interested in making herself appear in an adorned way. She's not adorning her body or beautifying her body. But in this second image, after she has officially sinned, we see that she's wearing this ornament on her head, and this demonstrates the vanity that is inherent in women as well. So these very subtle differences convey very specific messages. Here we have the expulsion from paradise. We still see this, uh, this decoration on her head, um, and we have this door here that is being blocked by a seraphim, kind of intimidating looking seraphim as well. And this, this angel here is escorting them out of the garden. It's uh, the book of Genesis says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So uh, Adam is charged with essentially farming and um, having to grow his own food instead of just live in this garden where food just kind of comes to him. And they're wearing these skins. So we see that they're wearing these sort of shaggy garments of, you know, some type of animal skin, some type of furs. 
In the book of Leviticus, we have more evidence of um, the differences between men and women. We have a long discussion of bodily fluids and um, impur impurities. Um, I won't read them. I won't read all of them now because I've been talking and talking. I'm running out of time. Um, but these are all in the book, uh, chapter 15 in the book of Levit Leviticus. And I usually reference the in new international version. Um, so if you find some differences, there, there may be some translation differences. Um, some significant figures from the Christian uh, past that we, we may uh, talk about again and again are Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. He was born around 1 AD. He was a Hebrew and he lived and worked around Nazareth and Jerusalem in this region of Judea or Palestine. Mary um, is a virgin theologically. Uh, she was the mother of Jesus. She was a Hebrew. Joseph was the spouse of the Virgin Mary and foster father of Jesus, also a Hebrew. The apostles were a group of 12 men who followed Jesus. All of these men were Hebrews. And then we'll talk about saints and martyrs repeatedly. Um, so saints are ordinary people who lived extraordinary lives. Um, sometimes saints are also martyrs, and martyrs are ordinary people who died for their religious beliefs. Um, especially in the early days, they are persecuted by the Romans, um, folks like Diocletian and other Roman emperors. Um, eventually, the, uh, the Roman emperor adopted Christianity, and sort of this sort of martyrdom stopped. There were several main centers of Christian um, teaching, and these were uh, Rome here on the Italian peninsula. Um, this is Antioch here, which uh, was part of Syria, Jerusalem here, and Alexandria in Egypt. So these are the main centers of Christian learning, and these were very important spaces um, for the Christian apostles and uh, other Christian missionaries very early on in the establishment of the church. The two main uh, sort of promoters of the Christian religion that we have in the New Testament are Peter and Paul. Peter was the rock on which the Christ, on which Jesus said the church would be established. He was an apostle known to Jesus, and he worked in the city of Rome. Um, he was the first pope. St. Paul spread the religion throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. He was not known to Jesus. Um, he had this revelatory experience after the death of Jesus, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then there were, again, these important centers in Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch. But there were many important women associated with early Christianity as well, and I want to give a shout out to those, to those women. As, oh, oh, I have three minutes left. Um, so Lydia was a businesswoman and dealer in purple cloth. Priscilla traveled with Paul throughout the Mediterranean. Some of the women were also jailed with Paul. And then Phoebe is uh, a deacon. And this is a, a titled church leader. Um, and then I've uh, included the places where you can find their names. There were a few roles that some women played, um, deaconess, widow and nun. There's some evidence that women were priests and bishops in heterodox Christian communities, so folks that were not uh, practicing like the official Christian religion. Um, important Roman women uh, adapted Christianity as well, so we had Augusta Helena, the, the mother of Constantine, and then Constantine famously converted to Christianity on his deathbed, but this was normal. Most people um, were baptized on their deathbeds. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna zoom through this here. Um, okay, so the Virgin Mary, um, she was uh, announced as the mother, she gave birth to Jesus, and then um, she uh, played an important role at the crucifixion and she was assumed into heaven. Um, so some important, uh, moments of her life are the Immaculate Conception when she was conceived, the Annunciation when Jesus was conceived, the Visitation when she met with her cousin, and her death, which is called the Dormition, the Kinesis, or the Assumption. And this has to, the, both the Dormition and the Kinesis have to do with sleeping. So she just fell asleep in, with God. Um, and I think I'll have to end there, but thank you so much for joining me this morning. I had such a wonderful time and I look forward to speaking to you over the next few weeks.
Okay. So maybe, I mean, we could uh, take a little questions. If Okay, if, great. So let's uh, stop the sharing so we can yes, see people. See. Okay. And uh, you could look at your gallery view. So any questions for Maureen? This is your chance to ask some questions. Okay. Surely them. Please, okay. Helen. Uh, Lillian, you have a oh, question. Oh, go ahead. And then Bonita has one after that. I was I was applauding. <laughs> <laughs> this was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were here. Oh, I am too. Good. And I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, Lillian, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, muted. there I am. Um, I want to go back to the ancient Greeks. You didn't yes. mention. Um, the courtesans and their status? That's a great question. Um, this is something that we that we might get into in the future. Um, so the courtesans had a weird status and, and thank you for bringing them up because they weren't considered proper Greek women because they weren't married. Um, they didn't have a husband to, you know, essentially give children to, um, but they were usually extremely wealthy and controlled their own wealth and um, could live their own lives, essentially. So they they occupied this really strange space in, in ancient Greece because they were wealthy and independent, but they weren't proper women. Um, so it was kind of this weird position for them. Uh, but most courtesans, so courtesans uh, were called um, hetera and prostitutes were called, called porna. So this is the root of pornography. And um, so they, they had a separate status, but these were women also devoted to Aphrodite. Um, and so they actually, prostitutes were sort of protected by Aphrodite. And although we think of her cult, you know, we think of her, especially today as like promiscuous and sex crazed, Af the cult of Aphrodite was quite austere. You know, it was very prim, you know, sort of prim and proper really. Um, but that's a great question. Um, the other thing is we don't know a ton about the courtesans. We do know of one, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she was just fantastically wealthy um, in Athens. And um, so we don't know a little bit about her, but yeah. Does that help at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. What great. was the source of their wealth? Their, their customers, their clients. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they I understand they also were more educated than the average woman. They could be, yes. And this has, this might have to do with the events that they attended, the symposia that I mentioned. So the symposia were events that men would attend at a proper Greek man's house, uh, an elite man, and their wives and daughters were not permitted access to these events. Um, and usually they start, they probably started off with intellectual conversation and they would talk about myths and maybe the Odyssey and the Iliad and things like that, politics, um, but they were essentially drinking parties. And I always tell my students that I'm thinking, I think it was up at Stanford, um, some art history or history students recreated one of the drinking games that they played. Um, and so my students were always like, oh, let's do that. And I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that. But um, they were essentially drinking parties. So I have a feeling that with the conversations that they would have with these men about these sort of erudite, if you will, topics that these courtesans could learn quite a bit and were able to have these conversations. And this also meant that it's likely that their clients, you know, would meet them individually and have these conversations and supply them with texts or supply them with stories. And so absolutely, it's it's very likely that some of these courtesans were, were really well educated. It's also important in my opinion, to remember that, you know, although men weren't, like, supposed to teach their daughters, you know, 
many men love their love their daughters and want to educate their daughters. So it's very likely that um, elite men did educate their daughters um, so that they were able to hold these conversations. And of course, this would be um, an educated wife would be, you know, you wouldn't want to be like, oh, my wife's really educated, but you know, it would create a great partner for you as well. Um, you know, one that you could respect and love. So I imagine that um, ordinary elite, well, ordinary elite women were also, could be well-educated in some instances. Yeah. Great questions. Thank you. Hey, Helen. <clears throat> yes. Um, throughout this pandemic, I've been watching many Smithsonian Associate yes. lectures and classes, mostly about art. Great. And I, yeah, there's been wonderful. But I also have to congratulate you. You are on a par with any of the uh, Smithsonian lectures I've, I've been listening to. Thank you so much. What a compliment. We welcome you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I had uh, Nancy and then Galen. Nancy Mead. Uh, and you've got to unmute, Nancy. Okay, now, hear yep. me? <laughs> All right, my question has to do with whether or not you have also studied uh, the role of women in Eastern cultures. So I, I have in Egypt, um, but not as much in, in Mesopotamia or the Hittites or the Assyrians, a very, very little bit, and not officially, just on my own. I've never and taken not, And not in the Asian cultures. No, unfortunately, I, I know very little about um, Asia, um, you know, Chinese, Indian, um, Japanese, Southeast Asian women. No, unfortunately, I don't know much about that. There is a book that I'm going to, I've, I've heard of it and I haven't done anything about reading it, but I'm going to look that up. And it is the story of women in China. Oh, it was written by so, uh, someone who has been on the faculty at UCSC. Her name is okay. uh, Emily uh, Honig. Honig. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And I think I want to, this makes me want to look into that too. Just yeah, absolutely. as a contrast, as a contrast. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And if you get the name of that, please send it to me if you remember. Okay. Ga Galen next. One, one of probably several artists listening to this. Galen, you've got to unmute. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering in that image of the elite man raping the elite woman, he has a kind of a, like a sword in his hand too. Is yeah. he gonna, is he gonna kill her too? Or, well, I I'm, think he was, I think, he, so that's a Renaissance painting. So that is sort of, um, you know, romanticized in, in a different way. I actually couldn't find any ancient images just in my very cursory search of looking for Lucrezia. I couldn't find any Im ancient images. So that was just one of the re Renaissance images that I found. Oh, I see, but, I see. Yeah, but I think um, the story, uh, and it's been a He's... long time since I read the story, but I think he does kind of threaten her with additional mm -hmm. violence on top of raping her. He's like, oh, yeah. I'll kill you if you don't. Uh, and then she ultimately kills herself, so. Oh, yeah, yeah it looks like a sword. Looks like yeah, a I think, I think, sharp yeah, I think in, in the story he has a knife and he's, kind of yeah wow. really assaulting her yeah okay. so thanks great uh, question I, irene did you have a question uh, no not at the moment thanks <laughs> oh, okay anybody else i don't want to miss anybody there uh lois lois and you have to unmute a, a sort of uh, a sort of personal or informational thing um did, have you done a lot of traveling to see some of these images you showed us or not as much not as much as I would like I think um in the next coming uh in the upcoming lectures I will have some pictures I was in Istanbul last summer so I was able to take a number of pictures there but I have never been to Greece I've only been to Venice in Italy so uh, I, I want to do some more traveling to get some more pictures. But um, one thing that I love to do is take pictures of myself in front of various monuments <laughs> to, to show my students. Um, they really get a kick out of it. So, 
And it shows you were there. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The other thing I like is it gives them a sense of how large or small the object is. Um, cause yeah. they can see me in class usually not during the pandemic, but, um, they can see me and get a sense of, of the scale. So it's helpful. Okay. All right. Anybody else? I don't see any. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. Thank, so, you. thank you. One week, one week from today. Yeah. Hopefully. I'll see you then. Uh, we hope. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank Great you time. all for coming. I look Thanks forward so much. To Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you. Great uh, images. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm glad you enjoyed them.